While people are still arriving, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the Every Learner Everywhere Expert Network powered by ISTE. Every Learner Everywhere recently launched the Expert Network to offer professional learning and coaching for higher ed faculty and leaders to support their students through and beyond the COVID crisis, including the transition to digital learning. We encourage you to visit the Expert Network website. We are posting the link in the chat for you so you can get more information and schedule a coaching session. Next slide, please. Welcome to the Every Learner Everywhere Strategies for Success in Online Teaching and Learning Interactive Conference Series. It is a pleasure having you with us today. My name is Norma Hollebeck and I'm the manager for network programs and services with Every Learner Everywhere. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to take just a few minutes to tell you about Every Learner Everywhere and the mission of our network. Every Learner Everywhere is a collaboration of 12 higher education organizations with expertise in evaluating, implementing, scaling, and measuring the efficacy of digital learning and its integration into pedagogical practices. Every Learner Everywhere is one of three solution networks sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The other two networks focus on advising and developmental education. We work with colleges and universities to build capacity among faculty and instructional support staff to improve student outcomes with digital learning. Our mission is to help institutions use new technology to innovate teaching and learning with the ultimate goal of increasing student success especially for first-generation college students, poverty-impacted students, and students of color. A few quick housekeeping notes. We are recording today's presentation, which we will share with you after the webinar. And throughout the presentation, we welcome your questions in the Q&A section. If a participant raises their hand during the presentation, we will not be able to unmute them. However, we will be monitoring the Q&A section as well as the chat. As a biology professor and former associate dean, I'm excited about today's discussion, differentiated instruction for equity in higher education. Our speaker is Dr. Rwanda Garth McCullough, Director of Programs at Achieving the Dream. Previously for 12 years, Rwanda was a faculty member in the School of Education at Loyola University of Chicago. Her expertise in culturally relevant teaching guides her professional development work in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. She has worked with K-12 schools and colleges to train staff and instructors on the principles and methods of culturally responsive teaching and revised curriculum across disciplines. Rwanda approaches her work from an inclusive, culturally affirming, and asset-based perspective. Dr. Garth McCullough supports educators to define and create opportunities to invite and integrate their students' cultural knowledge and experiences as a cognitive tool in service of their engagement, achievement, and success. Her workshops and coaching leads teams of educators to investigate equity for each element of their practices from policies, syllabi, and instruction to assessment. Dr. Garth McCullough. Thank you, Norma, and welcome everyone. I'm so pleased that you've chosen to join us today. I'll be presenting on the power and potential of differentiated instruction as a tool for equity in higher education. What I hope you take away from this presentation today is that differentiated instruction is a viable data-driven pedagogical approach for the virtual college classroom that supports engagement and student achievement. This approach strongly aligns with Achieving the Dream's student success vision to lead and support a national network of community colleges to achieve sustainable institutional transformation through sharing knowledge, innovative solutions, and effective practices and policies that lead to improved outcomes for all students. As one of our seven essential capacities, equity, is critical to our student-centered framework. As seen here in an excerpt of ATD's equity statement, 
we are fueled by the importance of ensuring that each student receives what they need to be successful through the intentional design of the college experience inside and outside of the classroom. And the, the full equity statement is in the chat if you want to um, click and read the, the full equity statement, which really guides our work and structures our mission. And our mission to help institutions use new technology, um, we, we share our focus on innovation within teaching and learning to ser serve the most vulnerable college student populations with our 11 Every Learner Everywhere network partners. Specifically, Every Learner Everywhere supports higher education institutions to use active and adaptive digital learning to improve student outcomes, as Norma already mentioned. I will begin today's presentation with framing differentiated instruction within the context of equity. Then I will discuss its structure, principles, and design elements, and provide examples to illustrate the power of this pedagogical approach in the classroom. Finally, I will end with practical teaching strategies and technological tools that can be used across disciplines to adapt instruction to meet the needs of learners. As student-centered college educators, it is imperative that we design instructional experiences for our students that work against the business as usual and the one size fits all mentality that we are, were taught to teach and how we were taught to make sure that we ensure an equitable environment where all students receive a high quality academic experience that is responsive to their needs, abilities and employment goals and that we take institutional responsibility to dismantle and disrupt traditional teaching practices that serve as barriers for students. We are keenly aware that some of our students begin our courses having benefited from access to resources, social capital, academically enriched curricular experiences and supports, while other students enter our courses having had to navigate structural barriers, discrimination, inadequate academic and social supports. And for some, they may experience all of these inequities before they log into your 10 a.m. class. Yet we are continually surprised when we get different student outcomes from traditional curricula that teaches the subject the same way, which disregards the individuals at the receiving end or only considers one type of student or learner. It takes an intentional and focused effort to create an equitable environment in college courses. And I'm well aware that equity is the new buzzword in education and it's too often misused. We all recognize that equity refers to the principle of fairness, but we can often confuse it with equality, a principle that we're frankly more comfortable with. It has been said that equity is the process and equality is the outcome. And I wanna recognize that equity requires a shift that can be uncomfortable for educators who have been taught that the right thing to do is to ignore differences, treat everyone the same, and it, 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 you know to be polite. And um, and you think about the first time in a grocery store when a mom is um, with their with her child, and and they point out a difference, someone who looks different, and you know we we were shushed, right? And we and we probably shushed our children, like don't stare, don't point. We'll talk about it later. You know our comfort level with difference is. Um, you know, leads uh, is is is, is uh, mostly out of our comfort zone, and so I recognize that what we're asking with differentiation it calls for faculty to make equity moves in their classrooms that are fair and just, but not equal, and to recognize the social and historical context of exclusionary practices in American higher education. Dr. Estella Ben Simone, who I try to pattern much of my work after charges educators to be equity-minded. And this mode of thinking requires practitioners to take personal and institutional responsibility for the success of their students and critically reassess our practices. And many ways that are uncomfortable and with the acknowledgement that most of us were not taught to teach this way or to view things this way. And so it, it, it's, a, it's a heavy lift and it takes, um, I keep saying intentional work, but it, you know, it, it, and, and, and also intentional support for faculty 
to engage in curriculum in this way. And I look at differentiated instruction as one way to address and, and support an equitable environment. Because differentiated instruction is an equity-minded pedagogical approach that allows faculty to meet the needs of the diverse range of learners in their class. According to the guru, Carol Ann Tomlinson, at its most basic level, differentiating instruction means shaking up what goes on in the classroom so that students have multiple options for taking in information, making sense of ideas, and expressing what they learn. The principles of differentiation include an environment that encourages and supports learning, quality curriculum, assessment that informs teaching and learning, and instruction that responds to student variance. And it's been more popular, obviously, in, K, in the K-12 setting, and I think overlooked in, in, um, in, in post-secondary. But I want to, one thing I want you to get from our time today is the really the potential for it to work in higher ed settings. And many of these practices you were probably already doing and just not knowing that um, that you know what what the term is called or that 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 it fits in this approach. It's too often um, dif differentiation instruction gets a bad rep for being like individualized instruction or tracking by ability, um, not just for students with, you know, it's not just for students with learning, learning challenges, and it's not a lowering of standards. Meeting students where they're at is not lowering standards, it's enhancing our instruction to make sure that our learners um, are, can access what we're, what we're teaching. And differentiating instruction as a student-centered pedagogical approach warrants more consideration in higher ed um, because it is responsive to students in all the ways that we claim we aim to be. It takes into account a student's learning profile, their needs, their goals. Why are, why are they taking this course? Why are they enrolled in, in college? Um, what, you know, what, what's their readiness, uh, their, their skill level? It takes into account their abilities and really emphasizes and assesses prior knowledge in, in a way that you can use it to decide, you know, to make um, instructional decisions. It also takes into account the languages students speak and their cultural and social economic backgrounds. When lessons are relevant to student experiences and every learner is valued, research shows students benefit in the classroom and beyond. And as faculty, we often make adjustments to our lessons in real time when it is clear that it isn't working for some students. Differentiated instruction just requires that we be more intentional from the start and keep the learners varying needs in mind as we design our courses and our instructional activities. This effort involves considering critical factors that help you get to know your students, assess their prior knowledge, in, in informative ways and monitor their performance on formative assessments, whether you gather information using a paper or pencil assessment or have access to a robust student level data and learning analytics from adaptive courseware. There is the potential for faculty to personalize the student learning experience and environment based on real time data by course content and, and objectives. When faculty are equipped with more in-depth information about their student interests, abilities, and content-specific performance, they are in a better position to present meaningful course content and more relevant assignments, assessments, and an overall learning environment and experience. Research shows that differentiated instruction has a positive impact on student learning equity and outcomes in post-secondary education. Studies have shown that faculty can address learner variability in their courses by proactively designing curriculum that supports students' needs. An intentional effort is needed, as I've mentioned, to ensure equitable education for all learners as online learning becomes the norm at this critical time in history. And thankfully, differentiation lends itself well to the online 
modality. As you attempt to make classes more interactive, engaging, and student-centered, you can integrate personalization and authenticity through well-planned instructional activities by using online learning tools. With this approach, it, it really meets the individual learners where they are along their journey. And Tomlinson refers to differentiation as orderly flexibility. While it calls for attending to students as individuals, it does not assume separate assignments or individualized instruction. It really relies on flexible groupings and, um, and you, grouping students, not just based on their ability, maybe on their, on their interest and, um, or, or the uh, learning modality that they're the most comfortable with. And a differentiated lesson will resonate with more students if it targets visual, auditory, tactile, and kin kinesthetic senses. And this means applying several different teaching approaches in your lessons, such as watching a TED talk, listening to an audio clip, putting students into virtual breakout rooms for a facilitated discussion. And when, we, I, when I think about differentiated instruction, I think about my daughter who has auditory processing challenges, very bright student, um, but she, you know, she does not learn by listening and, and has been in virtual learning since March. <laughs> Um, at, at her high school. And so when you only rely on one type of modality to share information, you, you just think about the, um, how many students you're leaving out of, the, um, at, out of the academic process. And I was sharing the story with someone yesterday that I, I didn't know she had auditory uh, processing issues. And I put her through Suzuki violin. And if anyone is familiar with that program, it, you learn the violin at age four by ear. And I was literally torturing her, um, you know, and th there were a lot of tears involved and we did it for many years because I was very focused on she's going to learn violin and this is the best approach and not realizing that we were not meeting um, her needs at all. And she, you know, exhausted so much energy and frustration uh, trying to, you know, meet these objectives that I had placed. So, um, and finally, when we found a teacher who would teach her just how to read notes she played and had and had a much more enjoyable experience with, with the violin. But I can report today, she now plays, she does not play violin, she, she plays the radio or, or the streaming service. So all that was, was for naught. And in, but I wanna also point out that institutions benefit with more equitable and high quality educational experiences available to students through an increase in course completion and graduation rates. And we think about many students who drop out or stop out because they're not able to engage and access information and, and navigate all the colleges and all the systems that we, that we place in front of them without, without a lot of support. And then to only get into a classroom where they may not be, the, the content isn't, um, it, you know, engaging, or they don't see a connection to, you know, when, you, when you're making choices, as many of our students are, between putting food on your family's table or studying, you know, it's really important that the content connects with the learner to, to, and they can see where this information is going to lead them and how it connects to their um, career goals, as well as their academic goals. And, and the, the, the institutional benefits turn and lead to social and economic opportunities for our students who are historically and systemically marginalized due to factors such as race, class, and gender. So the, all of those issues are exacerbated when you know, you're dealing with you know, real life issues as COVID has brought to the forefront, but that have always existed. So to understand how to apply this approach in your online classroom, it's important to note the key pillars of differentiation, content, process, product, and learning environment. So we're gonna view an example of a college biology lesson to just illustrate the, those key pillars. So the instructor adapts content process and product based on the academic abilities and learning preferences of, of their student. 
In this lesson, the instructor provides differentiated content based on student readiness by varying complexity, amount of scaffolding and agency on assignments. This allows students to work towards the same learning objectives while studying content appropriate to their level of understanding. Process is differentiated by offering a range of activities and methods to meet course goals so students have the opportunity to learn in the way that best suits their learning preferences and interests. Whether it's reading a chapter, or interacting, interacting with an online learning app, creating a cell from, designing a cell from um, online, um, an online design program, or identifying cell parts under a, a, a microscope simulation, students are working towards mastering course content. And then products can be differentiated by allowing students to demonstrate their knowledge and achievement of course goals in several ways. This allows students to showcase their academic strengths and personal interests while assessing their understanding of course objectives. Oftentimes faculty will choose to, um, will give, offer an op a choice of completing a quiz or illustrating uh, um, and labeling a cell, while others may choose to create an animated cell model. All demonstrate the, the same um, content, the same constructs and their mastery of the objectives. Another example from a college math um, and is from a college math instructor who adapts while teaching quadratic equations. This faculty used different materials or methods to teach the formula based on how familiar students were with the concept. And the objective was to help students at all comprehension levels without lowering performance standards. The content remains consistent, but how students access the content varies. And then based on their, the, the students, um, the instructor differentiates the learning process by offering a range of activities and methods to meet the course goals. It could vary, it could ver include, involve varying the time, tools, or group size that students are working with. And then finally, faculty can vary the way students may use the, and, and uh, the way students use to demonstrate knowledge and achievement of course goals. So this may include having a choice of taking a test, applying their knowledge to a real world problem, like, you know, how does the quadratic formula relate to, you know, a roller coaster, or doing a presentation. As a result, students learn in the way that suits their learning preference and can best better demonstrate their, their knowledge and ability. The fourth aspect of differentiation is related to the learning environment itself, creating conditions for optimal learning in the classroom. And this really, the importance of this was really showcased in our rapid transition to online learning during, during the COVID pandemic. The importance of the, the learning environment being con, you know, conducive, supportive, engaging, um, you know, could, could not be um, underestimated. Differentiation can increase student engagement and a sense of belonging in the course. And a few strategies that encourage interaction, collaboration, and flexibility include tiered assignments, layered curriculum, and intentional groupings. So when you're teaching online, it's important that it's more important than ever to be equity-minded and culturally affirming, which requires faculty to be intrusive, you know, using your early warning systems or LMS data to identify students who are struggling, reaching out to them, either through or if your institution supports a, a text platform. I know many faculty have, you know, used all their free their free licenses on, on every app that they that, that the students use to make sure that they um, could con stay connected with with students. And also, you know, culturally responsive approach is, is to be a relational by continually expressing your investment in your students' success and letting them, you know, validating that they are seen and that they are capable and that they are welcome in, in, in this learning um, experience is really important 
in, in an online environment when you're not um, face to face. And to make sure that the content and the assignments be culturally affirming by acknowledging and levering cultural strengths in every aspect of, of your course. And I know many faculty have found different ways to, to do each of these things. And if you wanna put in the chat some, some and share out some practices that you have found to be very beneficial uh, for your students and your students have responded to very uh, well, pl please do. I think it's really important for us to share the, the what's working as we are, as we are all facing uh, these, these uh, I, I, would, I want to stop saying unprecedented times, but they, this seemed to be never ending um, unprecedented times. And differentiation instruction online necessitates the use of a variety of instructional materials and practices. You know, keeping current and experimenting with new technologies increases options in creating an online classroom environment that is engaging and inclusive for all students. So a few examples include student response systems that allow for real-time collaboration and feedback, um, help instructors better gauge student understanding in order to differentiate the instruction and know where, where students' um, uh, prior knowledge is, um, is strong and where there's gaps and maybe where there's misunderstandings. Educational games can be used across a range of disciplines. They allow you to monitor student performance and promote self-paced and adaptive learning. And there are also digital tools that can be used to promote interactive discussions and facilitate online roundtables, discussions, and debates. In conclusion, and before we open up for questions, I wanna thank you for your time and attention and to acknowledge that most educators were not taught to teach this way. It is not easy and there's no cookie cutter approach with three easy steps that I can give you to follow because this work needs to be responsive to the students you teach and the context that you teach in. It is important to acknowledge that we are all on an equity minded journey to center the student experience in teaching and learning in ways that we have not been required to do before. And by adding these elements of differentiation into your classroom through deeper knowledge of student attributes and building variations into your curricula, you will be better positioned to contribute to student engagement, achievement, and success. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have during our remaining time together. So we do have um, some questions to, to direct your way. <laughs> um, one of them has to do with some of your earlier comments about equality and equity. And with equity becoming a buzzword, does that mean that organizations such as ATD need to make sure that they update or refine their equity statements to maintain their impact? Thank you, great question. I am, um... You know, equity was a founding principle at achieving the dream and when, when we developed, when we started over 16 years ago, and it wasn't a buzzword. I um, am adamant that we uh, continue our, our equity work and we don't let it, we don't let it be just a trend because I think it has so much potential to really identify where the source of the gaps are. I feel like in education, we've spent a lot of time um, uh, gap, what I call gap gazing. You know, we, we, we look at the data, there's a gap between the white students and the students of color. There's a, and, but we don't have a, a, what we don't have is a way forward often to address those gaps and to get to the, the level, the data at, get the data at the level that it is um, instructive or guides us to where the solutions are. So my, um, one of my in intentions in, the, in this work is really to work with, work at, work with faculty and in, in the institutional research department and um, build those, that alignment so that faculty have, or at least armed and equipped with their own data and can uh, and see where their um, racial equity gaps are, where their gender equity gaps are, and where their SES gaps are. It, we, you know, we report this data in the aggregate often, but it's 
that's as a faculty member, I don't know where I fit in that. I don't know what to do with that. And I don't know where I'm contributing to that gap. And so I um, am going to work. I mean, I, and, and at ATD, we work really hard at um, not letting the equity just fall off a, as a trend and also holding people accountable for understanding what equity is. Like we, we misuse it um, so often. And in many of my presentations, I, um, I, uh, I, you know, I, I just make sure we, we have a, a clear understanding of what equity is and what equity isn't. And, and uh, you know, most times when we say we think we're talking about equity, we're talking about diversity and inclusion. And I want us to hold ourselves accountable, our institutions and our institutions accountable for knowing the difference that, you know, diversity and inclusion are definitely are necessary and needed. But when we say we're doing equity work, we need to be doing equity work, which means really targeted, specific, drilled down, disaggregated, you know, at, at the level of, you know, working at the intersections of students' social identities, um, employees' social identities, and, um, and being true to, to that work. I often get frustrated, and my colleagues here from Every Learner will tell you, when, when I see um, resources that I, what I call, just have equity dust, you know, they put it in the title, they put it, and, you know, as a subheading, and then when you drill down to it, they're talking about all students, and they're and they're not naming, um, they're not naming, you know, uh, specific groups that they're talking about, or it's you know, it's you know, underserved students or underrepresented students. But I want to get us to the point where we're talking about, you know, part, you know, part student, black female part time, you know, that are part time students and are, are student parents have an issue, have this issue, are, are struggling with, you know, are, are facing this barrier. And, and we're not serving, you know, um, Latin, you know, Latin males that are, that are veterans, like, you know, that level, we collect all of this demographic data and we don't use it, at, 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 I think to, we don't leverage it as well as we can to um, inform the instructional practices. So with that said, you, your second part of your question was updating our equity statement. And we are actually going through um, a revision of, of our equity statement. Our president, Dr. Karen Stout, has charged us with um, a bolder equity statement. Um, so we, we will look forward to that in the upcoming months. And I also work with a few college teams that are developing and revising their equity statements. And I always start with the definition because oftentimes we jump into the statement and we want, you know, we want it to, to um, be, you know, shiny and glossy, but without understanding of what equity is and what our organizations or what our college's equity stance is. And, and, and um, anyway, so I, I have, I have grave concerns um, about exactly what you asked about that we're, that we'll let this, um, we'll let this, uh, focus on equity um, pass and not without without realizing um, it, its goals. And I work and will continue to work tirelessly. Uh, and I know at um, Every Learner, we are very committed to keeping the, um, being true to, to, our, to the equity mission. Thank you. Um, so earlier on when you were first starting to discuss differentiated instruction, the question came in uh, regarding grad work, graduate school work and medical school. Is it possible to use the differentiated instruction in graduate level work? I think so. I've, I only taught at the graduate level and I definitely use differentiated instruction. It's, you know, um, the, I can't speak to the medical school, although I can say that I've been very impressed with the medical field taking on cultural competence in ways that I have I have um, have been surprising to me that they're kind of moving ahead and with, moving faster. I think sometimes than than um, uh, academia is with with understanding the importance of cultural competence. So I'm not going to limit that they they wouldn't be able to do differentiated instruction. I'm just not as familiar with you know how the how the classes um, work and what flexibility um, you, you have in medical school, but in graduate school, most definitely. I 
employed it in, you know, with um, the assignment options, well, you know, in my, and, you know, I use rubrics, I assess prior knowledge. I worked with teachers who'd been teaching for um, 15 years, superintendents, and, um, and then people, you know, fresh out of undergrad and felt, you know, always had to adjust and, um, and differentiate uh, based on the, the, stu the students in, in front of me, um, the, their career stage, their um, racial and economic backgrounds, and making sure that my assignments, and I taught things like curriculum, uh, you know, development and assessment and sociology of education, and to, to you know, there's many opportunities um, in, in graduate school and what, you know, whether you're in the STEM fields or social sciences or humanities to, to, to differentiate. Okay, thank you. Um, and this question is something that I've heard a lot as well, and I'd love to hear different answers for it. Um, how do you demonstrate that the differentiated evaluations such as draw a cell, take a test, do a presentation, how do you um, demonstrate that they're equitable in their measurement? So that, that brings me to, you know, rubrics, right? So if I design a rubric and I, and I base it off the objectives and then I design an assignment, you know, to make sure that these different pathways all meet those objectives, right? And so that, that there's an opportunity. So, it, and, and when you think about it in terms of Bloom's taxonomy, it's, you know, it's just making sure that, you know, there's, you're hitting at those those different levels, and it, that doesn't only have to be in a paper. Um, I, I see Amy and in, in the chat mentioned, you know, is it okay to have a student do a verbal presentation and then later write a script? Like those are the exact methods that you can you can use if you're worried about, you know, you obviously you want to develop stu you know students' writing skills, but to start with writing for students who are, um, where that is, a, that is a, a, a stressor because they've been told they're not good writers and they've been told they're not good students, to, to begin with an oral assignment and then have them translate that into um, a written assignment, you can reach your goals, to um, have a project that, you know, you have, to, you know, you have the certain elements um, of the project that meet each of those goals. And so the cell example is you want them to learn the parts of the cell. So how, whether they tell you these are the parts of the cell or whether they write it or whether, you know, they do an interpretive dance, they're going to express to you their knowledge of the parts of the cell um, and in and, and a way that that's, that's more comfortable. So it's just, I think, for, um, and Norma, I don't know if, if, you, if you have an, another take on it, but I think it's just, you know, making sure you have your, you have your standard and that, and that the, whatever assignment you develop meets that standard. I, it, to me, it's, it's it, you know, you're, you're hitting the same objectives and, and you're not um, lessening uh, the rigor. So that, that leads actually very well into our next question because it has to do with, can you give an example of differentiated content in a single course? It is unclear to one of our participants and I, some others as well, I'm sure, how to achieve the same learning outcome when you have different content at different learning levels. That's you know, that's why, you know, in the classroom and in the d departments and things, we've got the curriculum in order to scaffold those levels. But how is it that you can make sure that you're, you're achieving those learning outcomes equally? With different content. So, um, so yeah, so, okay. Can you, can, oh, I know, I know this isn't your question, Norma, but can you give me an example of different content? I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Uh achieving the same learning outcome with different content at different learning levels, my understanding would be in terms of how you're handing it in. So as you pointed out, are you gonna make a model of the cell? You're gonna draw a cell, you're going to do a little podcast on the cell. So how can you assure when you're doing three different pieces of material, how you're actually gonna achieve the learning outcome at the level equally? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that goes back to yeah, what, what I, what I was saying is, you know, um, you have your, you know, once you have your standard, you want everyone to, you know, achieve this standard. Um, we often place value judgments on which way, you know, if someone writes a research paper that they must know it more than 
someone who, you know, does an, a, a PowerPoint presentation on it. And so, um, so I think I'm addressing your question, but I, I think it's, it's really about um, just make you, you know, making sure, and this is, this is not easy work to, you know, to differentiate. I would never say differentiate your whole curriculum, but like at once, but like, if you just take one unit at a time and, and say, you know, you know, maybe instead of having them read um, a chapter on X, I'll have them, you know, watch a, a, a TED talk or a, a documentary on it because that maybe that, you know, that they, they can get more of the nuances of the material better from that. Um, and so I think some people feel like, oh, but if they're not reading, then they're not learning. But the, your ultimate goal is to, you know, for them to learn the material. Um, and so to, to change the modality of the content, I, um, I think, you know, it is, it, you know, is, to make sure that it's at, you know, it meets their readiness level because it, at the, the alternative is what we continue to do. We teach to the middle and we're, we miss the, the, the students who are on the, you know, the lower end where they aren't able to access that information. And then we're, you know, we, we bore the students that are on the higher end that can, can move faster and, and, and want to, and want to take it, you know, want to take it further. Um, and so I, it, it's just really about thinking about your assignments and your assessments and, and you know, obviously your major projects, um, your summative assessments, in in ways that um, that allow for choice and and accountability. And that it, so it's it, so I just I use rubrics to just kind of keep myself honest in terms of um, when I when I'm when I was developing assignments to make sure that the rubric wasn't like I didn't write a rubric for the written paper, or the rubric for the for the oral presentation, and the rubric for the re you know the research project. I wrote one rubric with with all the standards, and 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 they would the student would demo, you know would have to demonstrate the, um, those capacities and those competencies in in whichever modality that they that they chose. So how would something like this work? In your example with the college algebra, you're wanting the students to learn to solve an equation. How, how many different ways are there to solve the equation? Or is it that you're looking at different ways to learn how to solve? Is it learning, taking the process rather than yes, I'm solving the equation, but is it the process of solving the equation? Is that where the variation or the differentiation comes in? It could be either. Yes, it, yeah, it, it could be either. So you could, I mean, you could, so you, um, with, with a differentiated instruction, I, it's not that you, that you vary the content, the process and the product for every, for every assignment, like you, you could vary the process to get to the solving the equation, you know, to solving the equation, um, and or or you could vary the the product for how they show you that they understand the solving of the equation. So you don't have to vary each of those aspects for every, you know, for every assignment. Okay, now I'm getting a little worried because <laughs> it sounds like that's an awful lot of work for for me as a faculty member who's already not only having to teach, you know, 15 hours worth of courses, plus do committee work, plus, you know, this, that, and the other. How does differentiation then not overwhelm our already overworked and underpaid faculty? Yes, I completely <laughs> understand and agree. And, and no, and so that's why I was saying, when, whenever you're, when you're designing or building out your, you know, your, uh, your, um, your course, for those who have the flexibility to do so, it, you just take it one bit at a time. So one semester, you, you know, you tweak your, you know, one of your assignments and, and differentiate it. Um, or, you know, you think about um, different ways that you're, that you're teaching and make, you know, and you're at, you're just, you know, just, re, just iterating, reiterating, like, um, you know, maybe I, you know, I, I lectured on this last time, let me add a, you know, let me add a video and, or let me, you know, assign a Ted talk instead of the paper. So you just, you start building, you um, your tool, your tools and your toolkit and your, um, as, as you, as you go, yeah, because it can be very overwhelming. If anyone asks you like differentiate your whole curriculum, you know, no way is anyone, is anyone doing that? But just as you're saying, okay, you know, I always did it when it, I'm like, this isn't hitting what I want. I'm, you know, I'm not getting, this isn't landing the way I wanted to land. They're not getting it. And then I would go to like, what can I do differently to, um, you know, to, to, to address the, the needs. And so, it, it, like I said, many of these practices you're already doing as you continually improve your, your course, because once you see that your student, I think 
none of us are probably still teaching the way that we taught anything the first day we taught it, right? You're constantly iterating um, the, the way we approach um, the way we approach it, um, a, a lesson or or um, or an, an assignment. So it's just building that in and being thoughtful about um, being intentional about building that in when you can. But bite size, Norma, bite size, not 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 the whole. You know, not I would even start with the whole unit. One, you know, if you start one semester, you know, next semester I'm gonna I'm gonna differentiate one. You know, one day. You know, one less one assignment, one assessment. And you just, and, you, and then as after you, over time, you start getting, I started, to, I developed a repertoire of like, okay, I, you know, even when I taught different courses, I, I, I had these, um, you know, different choice assessment option, product option in, in my, you know, in, at, at my fingertips. And I wasn't recreating it every time. Um, it was just, it was adapting it to that, to that material. Okay. <laughs> so, I, I was a little I worried wanna... that we were going to overwhelm all these faculty you know, and I started feeling overwhelmed going, man, I have to do this all overnight. Um, no, 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 not us, at all. <laughs> could you give us an example of both a tiered assignment and a layer and layered curriculum that you mentioned earlier in your examples? Yes, yes, um, I can, most definitely. Um, hold on. I had that, I knew I was going to get that question. I had that in my notes. Um, <laughs> so a uh, tiered assignment is... Um, Shoot, I'm gonna okay, so let me switch. A layered assignment is you have it, it's it's based off of Bloom's taxonomy, and you um, every student goes through every layer, but you start with like from rote and you know all the way to synthesis, and and you um, vary it in terms of you vary you vary the work in terms of complexity um, for each at, at each at each layer. So you're just intentional about making sure you're hitting. Um, every level of, of Bloom's taxonomy, and and um, and in, within that you can give choice, but it's just um, you're just making sure you take them from rote to all the way to you know synthesis, and not stopping at rote. You know, here, you know, okay, they they all they have is the you know they're all they've learned is the vocabulary. You know, you want you know can they apply it? Can you know can they synthesize it? And and you just make sure that you build those layers into your assign, into your, into your assessment and your process. Um, tiered is where you um, differentiate based on choice, accountability, and, um, and, I, and I think com complexity. So that, that's just where you, um, it's just a different way to approach uh, differentiate instruction where you're very um, specific about making sure you have choice, making sure you know, students are accountable for demonstrating their learning. So if you give an assignment where they've written a paper, you then have them do an oral defense of what they wrote to make sure they understand it and, the, and, and, um, and to assess their, their level of um, the depth of their understanding. Okay, we have um, commentary in the chat that I, I'm gonna try to reiterate as well as best I can here. Um, so much of being able to, it's basically noticing one owns implicit biases real time to reduce the barrier of colorblind individualism so that we feel more direct in making uh, desegregated learner groups, correct? Not correct, are we on the right path there? Second part of that is in other words, isn't equity-based differentiated instruction all about being culture conscious in confronting our own implicit biases during learning interactions and content decision. Yes, absolutely. I, I, this work and, and um, Norma shared my bio or um, at the top of the hour and I am, you know, my passion, my research is, is uh, based in culture responsive teaching. And I see different, I see differentiated instruction well aligned with um, cultural responsive teaching, which, like you said, starts with that self-awareness, knowing where our blind spots are, knowing what, um, knowing how culture, um, what role culture plays in our instruction, and confronting our own our own biases and make and, and interrogating our own practice to uh, identify, you know, where we may be perpetuating. The isms, right? Um, and 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 it, you know, and and intentionally, uh, unintentionally, 
Um, you know, uh, we often in our practice do what we, how we were taught or, you know, or, or you're, you're handed the syllabi and you don't question it. And what all of this work, um, equity-minded teaching work asks us to do is let, let's start questioning a little more about why we do what we do, who it serves, and, 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 and what ways we are um, perpetuating, um, you know, uh, racism, um, sexism, um, homophobia, xenophobia um, in, in, in our classrooms. And, and, just, and, just, and, and, it's, and it's, it requires us to be vulnerable, um, but it comes through in what we assign, the content that we, that we um, assign to read, the assignments that we construct or develop, the way we speak in class, who we speak to in class. It's so many la layers um, that um, our biases are, are demonstrated and our students experience our biases. And so um, it, it definitely takes intentional um, self-awareness work to, to do this well. So does that, doesn't it help then to use different, uh, to use universal design so that many bases of differentiation are covered as the, the instructors work on reducing the, our biases in real time? Yes, yes. All, all of, none of these things are in um, conflict with each other. They all serve the same, the same purpose um, of really equity-minded teaching practices that meet learners where, where they are. It's just, um, I feel like in higher ed, there, there, you know, um, there's so many teaching approaches that we have not really um, uh, adopted uh, and, and, and differentiated, culture responsive. Um, in K-12, you know, we, we, you know, the, the K-12 space has been talking about this and, and working and, you know, for years. And, um, you know, a lot of times as post-secondary um, educators, we've been, um, I don't say shielded, um, but we, you know, we haven't been really asked to, or required to, um, to adapt our, adapt our um, instruction in, um, in, in these ways and, um, and, or even been brought into the conversation of student success. Uh, I, you know, it's like that inside the black box, you know, where it's like, we, you know, no one knows what goes on in the, in the, in the classroom. And it's always been, um, it, it's, it irks me, but a lot of this work is, is optional. Like, you know, would you like to go to a PD about differentiated instruction or culturally responsive? And, and, and we, we view it as optional and it's only the, you know, the super users of the Center for Teaching and Learning um, hubs that are, you know, trying and taking risks and, and, and trying new things out to, you know, to um, meet this, um, the needs of their students. Uh, and that's what I goes back to what I was saying earlier. Then, then we're like, we, you know, we're, I don't know how we're still surprised that we're not getting the outcomes that we, um, that we, that we desire when we are not, um, when we haven't made the changes. We haven't made changes to our, our many of us um, haven't made the changes to, or we're not required to make changes to, to our practice. Um, so another question slash comment. Do you have often give a person first assignments using the product that best meets their needs and then later give an assignment that lets them build their skills? For example, let a student who doesn't like to write do a verbal presentation but later require them to write the script for a video or something else that enables them to build their writing skills. So could you build on that a little bit more and kind of help integrate not only with that, but um, some more concrete examples that could be yes. used? Yeah, so um, one of my colleagues uh, is a faculty developer at, at an institution and he talks about, he did a observation of statistics. This is a, this is a community college. Um, and two faculty members, they were on the same content and it was the same day. And he went in uh, to the first course and the faculty member started off with like, seemingly it was a pop quiz or the students seemed to be thrown, you know, caught off guard that there was a quiz. So, you know, not, not quite uh, sure where the, um, if there was a disconnect or if, if it was expected, but they, it, you know, they started off with a quiz the students, you know, went into panic mode, they shut down, you know, she, you know, she never got them back, you know, after they handed in, they're like, you know, they focused on what they 
they were very focused on what they didn't know. They didn't do well on the quiz and, you know, try, she went on to teach and they wouldn't engage. They wouldn't discuss. They, you know, they had, they, they were shut down. Later on that day, he goes into another faculty members course and started off with, you know, an, um, you know, come to the board and, you know, tell, you know, add to the whiteboard, you know, your understanding of this, you know, the, the, the concepts. And so they work together, they use collaboration, they, you know, they were able to um, orally express their, their knowledge and had no idea they were being assessed, right? And that class, the energy and that engagement, um, um, you know, was, you know, maintained through, throughout, throughout, throughout the, the, um, the, le the day, the class time. And, um, and so that to me is an example. And, 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 so, and, and so then it's not that the, the faculty member stopped there with the, you know, the whiteboard then, but then the students, are comp they built their confidence and then they, you know, went on to an assignment, which was, you know, okay, now write down what you understood. And, and th those students did better, you know, it, it, you know, had a better experience and really were using, um, uh, you know, what I said, culturally responsive, um, uh, teaching approaches in that they, they relied more on the oral presentation as a uh, and more collaboration as opposed to the individualistic, um, you know, assessment that that sh that shut the students down. So just and 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 they both you know they both got to the same place. The you know, students, everyone took a quiz, um, but it was it was um, the the approach built the confidence and honored what the students knew and also um, gave them an opportunity to work with each other to develop their understanding. So that's like, the, that's one example that comes to, to, my, to my mind about, um, about you know, how, you, how you can um, start with one way, but then still get them to, you know, if you have a modality or, or a, you know, a, a format that you want to um, work with them, um, that you want them to, to develop their skills in that you that you train you transfer it as opposed to start in that modality which which might um, cause them to feel that they you know that they don't understand. Okay, we are running out of time. I would love to thank you, um, Dr. Garcia. This has been a wonderful presentation, very engaging. We've had some wonderful questions. Um, we do ask that our audience take a few minutes to complete our survey for today's, today's presentation using the link that we're putting in the chat right now. Um, if you've got something going on immediately after, don't worry. We will send you the link to the survey when we send you the recording and the slide deck, which will both come, should come into your email inbox on Tuesday. Um, we get our uh, videos closed caption. So we do that over the weekend. We send those emails out on Tuesday. You'll get the slide deck link, you'll get the recording link, and you'll get the link to the survey if you don't have time to take it right now. As a quick reminder, we do encourage you to visit the Every Learner Everywhere website, our resources page. There were some questions in the chat about coaching. We offer one-on-one -on -one coaching through the expert network page. So if you want to go on there and look at our experts and Sign up for a no-cost session. We have these one-hour sessions with our coaches. You're welcome to do that. We encourage it. I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. We look forward to seeing you next week. Our webinar is Addressing DEI Issues in STEM Education. Thank you so very much for today. <music>